Many of you will remember uh, quite a few years ago now when I used to work for Professor Turnbull and he really trained me and set me off on this course. And over the years we've realised that there are lots of problems for us to solve in the area of mitochondrial disease. Too much for any one person to do and what he's been very effective at doing is building a team around you here, of which I am part, to try and sort out these different problems in parallel, all at the same time, so we can make progress. And it's very important, of course, that we think about the future and how we might stop mitochondrial disease affecting the next generation, but we're all here now. And we're all interested in trying to find out what we can do to help you as patients now. And I'm going to talk about one aspect of that before my colleague, Dr. Gorman, talks about the exercise. I'm going to talk about finding a pill to treat mitochondrial disease. Now, what I'd like to do over the next quarter of an hour, I won't talk for very long, is, is give you a little flavour for why this is a difficult problem. Um, and I'd also like to explain to you some of the ways that you can help and end by really encouraging you to feel optimistic that we're moving to a position where I think over the next few years we'll start to have pills that are a little bit more effective for these conditions. Now, I don't want you to go away thinking there's going to be a miracle cure because I don't think that's likely. But I think we are seeing progress towards something that will help with your quality of life. And uh, hopefully you'll get that flavour from the next quarter of an hour. The problem is, as you've heard, it's very complicated. And I don't want to bore you with all the scientific details, but this is a cartoon of a cell, which is one of the building blocks, the bricks, that makes up the body. And you can see how complicated it is. And Professor Turnbull's talked to you about the nucleus, which contains some genetic code. Um, and we're all, of course, really interested in these things called mitochondria. But you can see from the picture and all these labels that there are many, many different parts of the cell. It's very complicated. And what we want to do is we want to try and develop pills which target and improve the function of mitochondria, but most importantly, don't cause any bother to the rest of the cell. So it's this balance between benefit and side effects that's one of the issues that's very much at the front of our mind because first and foremost, we don't want to do any harm. And it's because of this complexity that all the clinical problems that patients with mitochondrial disease uh, come across are, are equally complicated. And it's this balance, really, that's held us back over, over several decades as we've been trying to find new treatments. <clears throat> So what have we got that's out there? Well, we looked at this first back in 2006, and we've recently had another look in the last six months. And what we've done is we've worked with this um, um, international organization called the Cochrane Collaboration. And you can actually download this uh, and look at these details if you want to. It's free. And the Cochrane Collaboration is a, a body of independent scientists who, who help us to look objectively, without any bias or any, any um, preconceived ideas, about what information's out there about treating any condition, but in our case, mitochondrial diseases. <clears throat> and so back in 2006, we went through a long process of trawling through every single bit of scientific information on the internet, in books, and magazines, and medical journals about mitochondrial disease to ask the question, is there any treatment that really makes a difference? 2006. And what we found in 2006 was that there were about 700 different documents out there around the world talking about treatment for mitochondrial disease. And we got them all out. You can imagine it took a while. And we looked at those in detail to ask the question, really, are they providing convincing evidence that these treatments are working? And when we looked at that, what we actually found was of these 700 documents, there were actually only six that were half decent and that you could really trust. In other words, these six were the ones that had been done properly, proper studies that we could believe in, for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And when we looked at those six studies altogether, the bottom line was that there was no really good evidence that any pills or any tablets were having any effect that we could be sure about for mitochondrial disease. So faced with that, we started a program of research to try and develop treatments, which I'll talk about in a second. But just to update you, we went through the whole process again last year. And the good news is, the world out there is thinking about this. So the first time we did this, we looked at all the bits of information that had been produced between 1980 <coughs> and 2003, and we found 700 
documents. We then looked from 1980 to 2011, June of last year actually, and we found there was double the number. So nearly 1,400 different documents writing about mitochondrial disease and possible treatments. So the world out there is searching for this treatment. Having said that, when we went through the process and asked ourselves which ones of these do we believe could be reliable, actually there were only 10 studies. So still, there's been no major progress in terms of finding a treatment that we're absolutely sure is going to have a big effect. I think you all know that actually. But this is the, this is the evidence by which we, we reach that conclusion and make sure that we as doctors in Newcastle are connecting with the whole world to get the best treatment for you. So lots of things have been tried, um, and the truth is, so far, we're not convinced any of them are having a really big effect. And you'll know some of these. Dichloracetate, creatine, builds up the muscles. Dimethylglycine's a treatment that's been tried in some babies with mitochondrial disease. Coenzyme Q10, many of you will be taking. Some of these don't do any harm, and so we use them because they might help a bit. But the truth is, we're not convinced they're brilliant, so we've got to keep looking for a new treatment. Now, this is difficult. It's difficult because you want a treatment, and I want a treatment. Okay? And so if someone comes along with something that they think might help, and we try it in, in you, you want it to work, and I want it to work, because we want to make you better. That's my job. And that's really dangerous, because then you're entering into a situation where you're hoping, really hoping the treatment works, and you can be misled. Okay? You can be misled because you try harder, in the study because you want it to work and I look harder because I really want it to work and we see an improvement when really it's not actually had an effect. We're conning ourselves that it's having an effect. And it's terribly important that we, we recognise that and design studies that get around that problem if we're going to make progress beyond these 1400 documents that are already out there. And we avoid convincing ourselves that snake oil is the right way forward. So that's the problem with these studies and it's important for you to understand that because then you'll understand why we design the studies in a particular way. One of the most important things, and something that a lot of the clinical team here have been working on over the last five years, is finding out the best way to measure mitochondrial disease. Professor Turnbull told you that this is different in everybody in the room who's got the problem. How do you compare apples and oranges in the same, in the same condition? It's all so different, it's difficult to know exactly how to measure a change and then see whether the treatment has an effect on that thing because everyone's different. And we've been working uh, as a group here in Newcastle to develop measures of mitochondrial disease that we can trust, that reliably measure what's going on in the mitochondria and how they affect the body. And this is an MRI scan of the heart, this is the heart here, and we can study this pumping away in the MRI scan and sensitively measure whether or not exercise or pills affect the way the, the heart functions in the body in an objective way that you can't influence directly as a patient and I can't influence as a doctor hoping for it to get better. So developing ways of measuring mitochondrial disease is important and you've all, or a lot of you, have been in, enrolled in a, in a study, a cohort study, which is helping us to work out the best way to measure mitochondrial disease. We need to measure it if we're going to treat it. And the second important thing is that to avoid this bias this effect that you get because you want it to work and I want it to work, we've got to construct a trial where you don't know whether you're getting the drug and I don't know whether you're getting the drug. So we're not influenced by this effect. And the way we do that is we have two arms to a study. Patients are either given the new treatment or they're given something called a placebo, which is a sugary pill that's not got the treatment in it. And we don't know as doctors and you don't know as patients which you're on. So if things improve, in the group that get the actual new drug, then we know it's the drug that's having the effect and not wishful thinking on our part. So placebo is very important. The downside is if you enter a trial, you might not actually get the active drug in the trial. So I'm going to tell you about the results of a study that was, was published a few months ago now in one particular mitochondrial disease called Leber's hereditary optic neuropathy. And we started with this one because we thought this would be the simplest to tackle as a first step, okay? This is a condition that runs through families. It's caused by a spelling mistake in mitochondrial DNA, as Professor Turnbull's described, and it typically affects men, although it can affect women, and it causes blindness that develops in the 20s. 
So this is a picture of two lads holding footballs, and this is what it looks like if you've got this condition. You can't see what's going on in the middle of your vision. Libus hereditary optic neuropathy. <clears throat> now, one way of measuring vision is to see how far down you can read on the chart. You've all had this done, I'm sure, as you've been to the optician. And in patients with this condition, Libus hereditary optic neuropathy, or LON, or Libus, it's all the same thing, you find that they can't read these, num these numbers and letters at the bottom of the chart because the sight's affected. In fact, some of them are so badly affected that they can't even read the chart. All they can do is count fingers, or maybe not even do that. So it's a serious mitochondrial problem, this. And we set out to see whether we could improve these measurements using a tablet that had been tried out in some patients in Japan and in Italy and looked as though it was having some effect. And this is what it was called. It's called idebenone, and it's a bit like coenzyme Q10. It's a slightly fancy version of it, basically, that, that we think gets into the brain and the eye a bit better. <clears throat> and this is how the study works, and it's important for you to understand this. In order to get around this bias, this wishful thinking effect, you've got to construct what we call a randomised placebo-controlled trial. What that means is that we have some patients getting the sugary pill, the placebo, okay, and it's randomised. So what happens is when someone's recruited into the study, a computer says, you get the treatment, you get the placebo, you get the placebo, you get the treatment, and I don't know who gets which, and you don't know who gets which. Okay? <clears throat> And so we did this over four years, collecting patients with this condition, many of whom came from this part of the world. We actually found 85, and 55 of those, the computer decided we're going to have this idebenone, and 30 of them were given the placebo, and we didn't know who was who until the end of the trial. And we measured their vision at the start, and started the trial, and we followed them for 36 weeks on either the idebenone or on the placebo, and we measured the vision at the end. And we followed them up for a period of time afterwards to see how they got on. So that's how it worked. What did we find? Well, the first important thing we found was that this treatment wasn't causing any harm, right? So the idebenone wasn't upsetting these patients any different to the placebo. Uh, it was a safe treatment. The second thing we found, and there are lots of different ways you can measure vision, and I'll just tell you one of them. Um, is, <clears throat> is we found that groups of patients who, at the start of the trial, all they could manage was to count fingers, actually, at the end of the trial, some of them managed to be able to read lines on the chart. They didn't have their blindness cured, but they moved up. The vision improved during the study. And just to put some numbers on that for you, <clears throat> this blue uh, information re relates to the group of patients who were on the sugar pill, the placebo. Now, before they got the treatment, the placebo, 29 of them um, couldn't read the chart. They could just count fingers. And after the study, they still couldn't read the chart. There was no effect. But when you look at the patients that were given this drug, idebenone, <clears throat> when we started, 61 of them couldn't read the chart. And at the end, 12 of them could. So a fifth of them seemed to move from just being able to count fingers to be able to read this line on the chart. Sounds very good. Now, there are a lot of reasons why we've got to keep looking at this idebenone situation and why we can't present it as the actual treatment for mitochondrial disease at the moment. It may well work in Libas, and further work is required. And actually, when we look back at the information, it turns out that a specific subgroup of patients, genetic subgroup of patients, um, seem to do better than others. And it may well be that they're the ones that should get this treatment. And the good news is that the Medical Research Council in, in London has, dis has agreed to fund a follow-on study to see whether this subgroup of patients actually does do very well on this treatment over the next three years. Just to give you a flavour, that, that research grant is over a million pounds. This is very expensive stuff to do. That's just for one treatment in one mitochondrial disease. But what this study has shown is that we can get together as a group of doctors. Actually, the doctors involved in this were in Germany, here in Newcastle, we led it, and also in Canada, that we can get together and collect together patients with these rare conditions, and we can construct these proper clinical trials and stepwise find new treatments for mitochondrial diseases. This is the big change. And so I think the future 
is that we're going to start chipping away with the new treatments that are online coming out of the research laboratory and over time start to make improvements and changes to the way we treat patients with mitochondrial disease over the next four or five years. And that's where you come in, of course, because recruiting to these trials is the key to the success. It took us nearly two years to find all these 85 patients with Libra's hereditary optic neuropathy. In the next trial, it'll be quicker, because people out there know that we're, we need business and that we're really looking for a treatment that works. But with your help, critically with your help, in helping us work out the best way to design these trials and to join the trials so we can see whether the treatments work, we'll move on to uh, fresh pastures and then we'll have some pills to treat mitochondrial disease. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Patrick. That's fine.